This podcast is brought to you by the Deluxe Edition Network. To find more great shows on our network, head over to the den.show. Hold on to that. Welcome back to the shit show 2.0. Okay, boomer. Damn millennials. Wow. <laughs> Did not know that. Even flirters who who are obviously mentally ill. You want to be my wife? Oh, this is gonna go downhill real quick. <laughs> is going on and welcome to take on a world nathan blaze and mike d uh nathan and i get back together again yep 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 one more time it's gonna be a habit you know i'm having a lot of fun on this i love i love when you're down here at Uh, first at first i was kind of like iffy because i didn't know how well i do i thought i'd be very nervous you know how well you do (laughs) oh yeah but like I guess sitting on a computer talking to people uh, behind the screen all day really gives you some uh, talking to a microphone skills, if you will. Wait, here's what I like about it. And we've talked about this in previous episodes that we've done together. You and I have always had fucking outstanding conversations when we're driving someplace. I've always, I love them. I love that, that we had, when we drove to Iowa, 16 freaking hours. Oh, yeah. It was just, we just talk about the craziest shit. And uh, when me and John started the podcast, we started it because of the conversations we used to have at lunchtime. And it's the same thing with you and me. We'd have these conversations and it was like, like sometimes I was like, how the fuck does this kid know this shit? And sometimes it's like, where the fuck did he get this shit from? And sometimes it's like, this kid's crazy. <laughs> oh, I can assure you. I'm definitely a little crazy. But it was always fun, so. I'm drinking a horrible mint chocolate milk stout. You seem like you're having a very fun time with it. It, it hurt. Your facial expressions tell me you're absolutely loving it. Like, it's the best thing you've ever tasted. You've never tasted anything better. It pains me because I love left hand. I love left hand milk stout. I, however, do not like. I almost smack myself. I do not like the mint stout. Uh, so we teased the last time we were together about doing the history of a different soda company. And the one that I had done research on first was Pepsi. And I see you're sporting a Pepsi. Yes, I'm sporting quite a nice Bepniz. Bepniz? Yes, Bepniz. Um, so... We're going to do Pepsi today. Um, There was some interesting stuff in the Pepsi lexicon, uh, including something I don't know if you know. I don't know as much about the history of Pepsi as I do with like other drink companies like Dr. Pepper or Coke. So eventually, we will be doing Dr. Pepper. (laughs) Dr. Pepper. We Watch will, it. <laughs> Watch it. <laughs> we will be doing Mountain Dew, although I, I have no idea what the Mountain Dew history is. Uh, we will be doing Coca-Cola. We will be doing RC Cola. We will be doing Fanta. He loves Fanta. I love Fanta. And I always thought that Fanta was uh, a South America soda. And you may too, so it may be. I don't know. You'll have to listen to find out. Yes, you will. So today is Pepsi. So when you think about soda, soft drinks in America, two major names will always pop in. Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Like, they've been the top of the heap for the, for the longest time, almost as long as I've been alive. Um, there are many other drink companies that we're going to be taking a look at in the future, but we're going to start with Pepsi. And if you're like Nathan or I, you, you wonder what's the history of these companies? What, what, uh, what 
their origin stories. What terrible, terrible things did they do to get to this point? What inhumane experiments? What? Wow. What secrets? You went fucking dark, bro. <laughs> what secrets lie behind the red, white, and blue? I, I'm interested in because when a lot of these companies, you know, there was a lot of shady, shady corporate espionage, shady corporate greed, shady corporate for soda. For any corporation, any company back then, there was a lot of things that were shady about the the industrial revolution. And, like, what did they have to do with these guys? So, uh, Pepsi had very humble beginnings. Okay. Uh, Pepsi has become one of the most recognizable products uh, and has been in an endless battle over the years with Coca-Cola. Oh, yeah. I forget what the exact market share is, but it's... It, they're close. They're close. Uh Coca-Cola once eclipsed Pepsi. And at some point, um, I just wanted to mention quick that we are on the Deluxe Edition Network, which is the Den Dot Show. Uh, it's just a, a place where there's a bunch of great podcasts. Many great podcasts. Yeah. Uh, actually, on my podcast list are three quarters of the podcast on the Den Network. I, I, I listen to them all the time. Um, so... Sh- be sure to check out the den dot show. So on the den network, every month they have a spotlight podcast, and this month it is Let Lives. Uh, and this podcast does movie reviews. He does some watch alongs. Watch along, yep. Um, and uh, so check them out on the den dot show. Uh, look for a spotlight podcast, and it should direct you to that. Uh, Pepsi had some very humble beginnings. Um, They've been in an endless battle with Coca-Cola. I don't know if I already said all this. Uh, Coca-Cola once eclipsed Pepsi. Yes. So Coca-Cola once eclipsed Pepsi in the market share to the point where uh, Pepsi has gone bankrupt um, and and came back from bankruptcy under different ownership, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, the original Pepsi-Cola was invented in 1893. By Caleb Bradham. Uh, he was a pharmacist in New Bern, North Carolina. Why are so many sodas start off with pharmacies? I'm going to tell you why. I know the answer to that. Really? Yes. What's the answer? Because uh, Nathan Jump Ahead, the very next line, read the very next line. We are, we Back are. in those days, a lot of drugstores also operated ice cream shops and soda fountains. In this particular drugstore, he operated a soda fountain where he served drinks he created himself. Okay. So, <laughs> John does that a lot. Johnny jump ahead. And it's usually like the next line, just like this. Uh, the What would happen is, is a pharmacy couldn't sustain itself on medication because medication although it was expensive back then is was the profit margin wasn't like it is now so they'd have a diner or they'd have uh, a fountain soda fountain uh counter or they'd have an ice cream counter so the, the parents would come in give their kid a, a penny to get a soda go back and get their prescription and a lot of the pharmacists back then Mix their own prescription. Okay, yeah. And there's only a few pharmacies around here that'll do custom mixing. One of them is in Schuylkill Haven. Really? Yeah. He's, All right. He still do, does some custom mixing. Okay. Uh, but if you go in there, there's like that long counter. Well, it used to be fountain soda. A soda mm-hmm. fountain. Really? Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. So, um, not in my time. That was before my time. What? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the the soda fountain craze kind of uh, died out in the sixties. Okay, and that's when they went to bottling more so than. Uh, now you, you still had the syrups that they used in, like the canister there, right there. Yeah. Uh, so that's I use that as a keg for my beer. Mm-hmm. 
but that was actually soda syrup in there, and they mixed it with carbonated water. That's a lot of soda syrup. Right. Well, now you see those new machines, it's just a little cartridge like this. Yeah. So it's it's like highly concentrated soda flavor. Where I where I work, yes, we have those, and I have to replace those cartridges all the time. They're like this big, yeah, and like that thick. And then inside is a pouch that's like only seventy percent of the box. Yeah. So um, so they had these soda fountains. They had uh, ice cream counters, and that supplemented the income for the pharmacist. Well. To even make it better, they would come up with their own soda formulations. And this uh, this particular one was called Brad's Drink. Brad's Drink. Because it was Caleb Bradham. Bradham. So uh, it was a mix of sugar, water, caramel, lemon oil, cola nut, which is highly caffeinated. Yes. Uh, nutmeg and some additives. As the drink became more popular, Bradham decided it needed a snappier name. So he bought the name Pep Cola from a local competitor. Dude, it's every time you lift to, to, to get your soda, I don't know what that is. I think it's feedback from the headset. I don't think it is. I think I need to maybe take these off and put some um, uh, dialectic cleaner on them. Oh. Uh -huh. Because it's damp down here. Could be some oxidation. I don't know. Anyway, thanks for making noise in my microphone. You're welcome. Um, so he brought this Pep Cola name from a local competitor, and then he eventually changed it, settling on Pepsi Cola. Uh, in 1903, he trademarked the name and was selling soda syrup to other pharmacies and vendors throughout North Carolina. So right now he's... He's regional, North Carolina only. All right. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes, you can. So, I saw in there you have cola with a K for Pep Cola. Is yes. that because of the cola nut? The cola nut was spelled with a K. Why is the drink spelled with a C? Um, Pepsi Cola was made after Coca-Cola. Okay. Coca-Cola, in its history, um, their... I want to say it was their financial guy All right. for the company, uh, had very distinct, perfect penmanship. And when they wrote Coca-Cola with a K, he felt it flowed better with a C. So in, in his handwriting, his script, he wrote that Coca-Cola, and that's a trademark you see today. So everybody else followed suit. So when with the RC Cola, with the lawsuit, mm -hmm. Which we haven't talked about yet. I'm not trying to skip too far ahead in the future. But that's why the C in cola was. I think if RC cola was RK cola, there would be no problem. Yeah. And you might. RC cola may be one of the most popular drinks now because they were overtaking Pepsi and Coke. Oh, yeah. And we can talk about that more in the RC cola episode. Yeah. yeah. So stay tuned for that because it's some interesting shit and it's some shady shit. Oh, yeah. And, and that's what I said. These these corporations back then, the, there were no scruples. Like when people think of capitalism as a, a mean thing, they're thinking about the 1900s in, in the United States. Yeah. But I didn't want to get too far off track. I just want to know why it was a C instead of the K. That's why. All right. Uh, people didn't really know what the colon nut was. And... Uh, the Coca Cola, even though, and, and you see the Coca or the Pepsi Cola is still script, just like Coca Cola. Yeah, Coke should have sued them more so than they sued RC. So, um, we have. So, he trademarked it in 1903. Uh, he started selling his so his syrup to pharmacies around and. and vendors around North Carolina. Originally, it was sold as a digestive to relieve indigestion. I had heard this before. Now, I know when I was young, if your belly didn't feel so good, you were to drink ginger ale and eat saltine crackers. Yes. Ginger ale, cure all. Yeah. Uh, basically, what it did, it was carbonated, it made you burp. Yeah. 
and if there was gas in your stomach and that was causing your your discomfort, it got the gas out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, that's how not only Pepsi was marketed, but Coca Cola was marketed that way too as a tonic. I'm sure, but Coca Cola was marketed as a tonic for other reasons too. And you shall find out when we do that episode in the future. <laughs> Uh, by 1910, franchisees, franchisers, were selling Pepsi in 24 states. Wow. Which, in 1910, that's good. That is really good. And that's only, what, like, seven years after he trademarked it. So, in 1913, Pepsi hired Barney Oldfield as a spokesman. Who is Barney Oldfield, you may ask? Someone who's old? He was a very famous race car driver of the era. Wow. So basically, it was one of the first celebrity spokespeople. Like like a nationwide known celebrity spokesperson. Yeah. Uh, he became famous for the uh, slogan, drink Pepsi Cola, it'll satisfy you. Uh, no, not, not, not too catchy by today's standards. Well, back then, advertising was much different. It didn't have to be so glitzy or glamoury. It just had to stick with you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, like Burma Shave. Burma Shave used to do those stupid signs along the road. Mm-hmm. It would be like, for a mile, you would see a sign. <laughs> and Like, when we went down to the World War II weekend, they had the Burma Shave signs on the road. Yeah. It'd be like, I don't know. You got scruff. You don't get no muff. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but they would have these things about shaving, Burma Shave. <laughs> Uh, so after years of success, success, Caleb uh, Bradham lost Pepsi Cola. He lost it. Yes. And what he did was, is he was wagering on that the price of sugar would continue to rise through World War One. Um, and the price didn't rise; it fell. So he had bought all this sugar. So he had a, a large inventory of overpriced sugar. Uh. And in 1923, he could not overcome that debt, and they went bankrupt. Wow. So that could have been the end. That could have been the complete end of Pepsi-Cola. No more Pepsi. No more Pepsi. Uh, I wouldn't say no more Mountain Dew, because that was his own entity Mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, But done. Pepsi-Crystal never happened. World War I really almost knocked out so many drink companies. And, and a lot of it was because of the sugar prices, because uh, the same thing happened out in San Francisco with it wasn't a distiller. And I don't think it was World War, it was before World War, it was like old, like uh, it was might be it, they were old wooden chips. Mm-hmm. So these wooden chips were coming in, and there was someone out there who, I just saw something or read it, he bought all kinds of sugar thinking that might have been World War I. He bought sugar thinking that the price was going to go up. And the, the only sugar you could get because of a war someplace was sugar from like Asia. And he bought all the sugar at this ridiculous price and then he, he didn't, he held on to it instead of selling it right away. Well, the next ship came in with sugar, and then the price went down. And then, in that, and now it was a steady flow of sugar from that era, from that area, that his sugar was worth nothing and ended up being bankrupt. Ugh. And I can't remember who the heck it was. Anyway, uh, so over the next few years, the company changed hands a couple times through several investors. In 1931, Pepsi was bought by Loft Candy Company. Loft Candy Company. Yes. Um, Charles Guth was the president of Loft. Now, you know our ancestry are Guths. Really? Yes. Lawrence Guth was one of the first German settlers to come to the United States, and he is in my bloodline someplace. I did not know that, so we owned Pepsi at some point. Do you know where you go to school? Your college? Yes. Okay. Just up the road from that. I don't know if the Alpo factory is still there. Is the Alpo factory? Um, I don't know. So if instead of coming up 309, mm-hmm. go down 309 towards 78. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you get off, when, okay, you're going from 78 to your school. 
you go up that that long stretch. There's a car de- uh, Mercedes dealer there. Yep. When you get to the next light, that's South Whitehall Township. Okay. The town that it is is Goothsville. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that there's a cemetery over there and the church. All that land in that area was my first ancestor in the country. And when he passed away, he donated it to the church. So there's a monument in that cemetery for Lawrence Goose. Huh. That's cool and all, but we owned Pepsi. How do we mess it up? I don't know. Well, one of our ancestors. There can't be too many Goose in the world. No, there really can't be. I, I can't. I don't imagine. Don't be goofy. <laughs> anyway, I digress once again. Um, so Charles Groot, president of law, he struggled to make Pepsi a success. But this was the depth of the depression. Like, oh, okay. Like the depression was killing everybody. Yeah. Uh, things were going poorly for him. At one point, now this is this is what I thought. Maybe you didn't know. At one point, he offered to sell Pepsi to none other than executives at Coca-Cola. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. I'm like, holy shit, we could have ended up with Pepsi and Coke in the same stable? I bet you they're rolling over in their graves right now. Oh, if they had done it then, that would have been the end of competition. They would have had a monopoly on the market. But they didn't want to do it because they didn't want to keep producing both products and to spend money on a product that you weren't going to produce wasn't really a thing back then yeah now it is because of people seeing oversights like this so goof reformulated pepsi and he began to sell in 12 ounce bottles for five cents okay coca-cola was selling six ounce bottles for five cents better deal better deal so they started towning the uh Tagline twice as much for a nickel. I did hear that. I did hear that. Yeah, it, it, I, it's genius. And all they had to do was reformulate the product, amount of sugar, whatever yeah. ingredients, and they probably got the same amount of ingredients in a twelve ounce bottle. Probably without changing the flavor too much. Probably, probably close to it. Yeah. So uh, they started touting. Well, they, they it became a hit with the nickel nickel radio jingle which was first broadcast it was it was the first commercial to be broadcast coast to coast Pepsi has the first of a lot of things and it was it was my people who made that happen and, and he almost Job gave, goof. he almost gave up he almost sold the coke and he'd be kicking himself in the ass oh yeah so uh that jingle was eventually recorded in 55 languages. And it was... 55? Yeah. It was named the most effective ad of the 20th century by Advertising Age. <sighs> so, World War II rolls around. They learned their lesson from World War I. Like, they didn't want to repeat of that. So they made sure they had a reliable sugar supply before the war started that would last them through the war. Mm-hmm. Um... So Pepsi became, a, like, wherever our soldiers were fighting, Pepsi became a mainstay with them. Now, Coke was, too. But Pepsi was sent everywhere that our troops were. So any place in the world that you know, U.S. soldiers and GIs were, there was Pepsi. So after the war, the brand remained in those areas. So long after the GIs returned home, there were people in that area still drinking Pepsi. which was smart. Smart by them. Because that helped them spread wildly. Right. And there's another first coming up for them. In a little bit. Oh my. Which is something I didn't know. Uh, so now back in the States, U.S. soldiers returned home and they continued their love for the Pepsi-Cola. And, and there was still a lot of love for Coke. You know, Pepsi was still the second best selling soda. But there was, like, like at that time, like we talked about, all these fountains, uh, fountain soda places, they had their own formulas, but people would go in there and they would want Pepsi. They would want Coke because the advertising and, and the way it was put forward. Yeah. So now, you don't know this name. I do. Uh, 
Now, the company of, or the, the president of the company was Al Steele. He married Joan Crawford. Okay. Uh, so Joan Crawford, any place she went, when there was a corporate gathering, uh, she would visit local bottlers mm -hmm. during the 1950s. She would come and promote the product. And she was a movie star. Yeah. I actually do know the name Joan Crawford. I've never seen anything with her in it, but I know she was very famous. Yeah. Well, you might have seen stuff in it with her in it and not realize it. Probably. So during the 60s, Pepsi set their sight, sights on the baby boomers. Hmm. Uh, the, uh, now, the, in the 60s, the baby boomers were the young people. Yep. Uh, so they were appealing to the young people with the Pepsi, Pepsi Generation ad campaign. Now, that Pepsi Generation ad campaign went from generation to generation. When I was young, they were still using Pepsi Generation. Really? Yes. And they were still targeting younger people. That's crazy. So, uh, uh, in 1964, also targeting, targeting younger people, the company produced their first diet soda. So that, that's around the time that diets, you know, RC was the first diet yes. soda. Yes. And like they had success in the beginning and, you know, Pepsi and Coke were like, Oh, wait, maybe we should do something too. So 1964, they did, uh, the 60s for Pepsi brought a lot of changes to the company. Oh, this is when they pulled on Mountain Dew. Yes. In 1964, they acquired the Mountain Dew brand. In uh, 1965, they merged with Frito-Lay, the snack company. Wow. Yeah. I knew it was part of Frito-Lay, but... So, by the 1970s... Uh, the brand was... Just on the verge of overtaking Coke as the top soda brand in the United States. Now, this, this, this is the uh, other thing here. 1974, Pepsi made international headlines by becoming the first product to be produced and sold within the USSR. Yes. Did you know that? Yes. I, I didn't know that. Because Pepsi also, for a short amount of time, was like the, one of the top five most armed anything in the world gate. Technically, it's a list of countries, but Pepsi overtook most other countries because they traded with the USSR for nuclear subs in turn for Pepsi. I, you know what? I, ah, I was looking for that, and I, I forgot about that. Like, I, I remember that. They, they actually had, what was it? The, the third largest sub fleet yes. in the world because of a deal that they made with Russia. Now, the subs weren't really good for anything. They were outdated. They were, but still, the, I remember that. I wish I knew the details on that because. Uh, there's exact numbers out there yes, somewhere. Yeah, I know. So look for it. I forgot about that, dude. I remember, oh, man, there you go. It's in your head. That's why you're here, bro. Because I would, I would not have mentioned that at all. I forgot completely about that. They made a deal. For production rights in the USSR, and the USSR in turn, and it was a net loss for Pepsi. Yes, because the subs weren't worth anything. Yeah, that. <laughs> so um, now I just want to. I'm going to interject something here, and it's something that we're going to come into during the Coca Cola uh, episode. They keep saying produced. In that country, what they would what what Coca Cola started was they would make the syrup and they would send it to local bottling companies like Coca Cola Bottling Company, Pennsylvania, Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So they send a syrup, they buy the syrup from Coke, they carbonate it and and bottle it, and then they ship it out to places all around. Um, but Coca Cola kind of started that. And most of the nationwide cola industry is the same way. They do it the same way. They follow that that pattern of business. And uh, Pepsi was no different. Uh, he even back in in the day, he would sell his syrup to the other fountain, the other pharmacies with soda fountains, and then they would carbonate and put, mix it with carbonated water and serve it. 
Mm-hmm. Well, that's how that model Evolved. came came to be the standard in the industry. So, uh, throughout the seventies and eighties, Pepsi continued to target young drinkers uh, with this Pep- Pepsi Generation campaign. Now, the seventies and eighties is, is my time. I remember the Pepsi Generation. I also remember they were targeting older drinkers with the Pepsi Challenge commercials. Now, what were the Pepsi Challenge commercials? They would do in-store taste tests. They would put three sodas out. One would be Pepsi, one would be Coke, one would be... Don't know. Um, Maybe during the 70s, it was RC. And they would do a blind taste test, and then they would... People would drink it, drink it, drink it, and then they'd pull a sleeve off it. Oh, you picked Pepsi. Wow. But that was how they targeted older people because older people wanted analytical evidence. Mm-hmm, Younger mm-hmm. people wanted something that related to them. Mm-hmm. So kids my age were a Pepsi generation. Just like WWE had Generation X. They had DX for Lexi's generation. Mm-hmm. And and me because I liked it. <laughs> but, you know, they they want something targeted to them, something that's that speaks to them. Pepsi generation was something that spoke to people. The taste test spoke to the older people. So that that's that's actually cool. There's there's a lot of thinking that goes into marketing. Oh yeah, yeah. But there's, there's people much smarter than me thinking that shit. Oh, <laughs> much smarter than me. Uh, in 1984, Pepsi hired pop star Michael Jackson at the height of his thriller success to be its spokesperson. So. They would do TV commercials. Now, I remember these. They would do TV commercials, and they'd basically be almost a full-fledged music video. And, like, they would make a 30-second or 60-second commercial, but they also made a long version of the commercial, and then they'd cut it down to 60 seconds. So they would make, like, a four-minute commercial. Really? That you really never saw. You might see it on MTV as a video, and they'd cut them down to these 30-second or 60-second spots. And, like, all of the, the pageantry that Michael Jackson had went into these commercials. You had pyrotechnics, you had dancers, you had the music, you had all this shit. That's crazy. And that worked so That's well so for them crazy. that they went on to hire other well-known celebrities. Tina Turner, uh, Joe Montana, uh, Michael J. Fox, and Geraldine Ferro. Now, Geraldine Ferraro in 1984 was a, a Democratic vice presidential nominee. You know, it makes such a big deal about uh, now uh, women running for, for office. But back in the 80s, you had women running for uh, vice president. Mm-hmm. Not so much president, but for vice president back then. And it, it was like, it, it was a big thing then, just as it is a big thing now to actually have a woman as a vice president, is it's a big deal. But the, you had people running back as, as far as 1984. So um, the pressure that uh, Pepsi placed on the industry made Coke make their single biggest mistake ever when they came out with their new Coke. Uh, I I know about this. Okay. I swear I've gotten to try it, but the, the timestamps just don't line up with my lifetime. No, they don't, but it doesn't mean it wasn't still around. Like It doesn't mean that like they went, because I, I think at some point, like with Zima, the Zima was made and then it went out, and then like every so many years, they, they did a, another run of it. Mm-hmm. So they might have made another run of, of New Coke while you were... Not, I don't know. I don't think so. But New Coke was made, they toned down a little bit, most of the ingredients, except for sugar, which they toned way up, almost doubling the amount of sugar to compete with how sweet Pepsi is. Uh, I, I remember this, and it was an unmitigated disaster. I know that there was a lot of... Uh, there was a lot of negative feedback. There was the negative feedback was even actually like it wasn't just negative. It, it, it was like people were up in arms about this. 
why would you change the, the formula of Coke when it's so good? So within three months, three months, three months, they backtracked. And uh, they came back and they reintroduced this classic Coke formula. But it was never the same. It no. was never the same Coke as it was before. No. I, I don't care what they say. I remember this. And it did not taste exactly the same. I thought they just took new Coke, put it in a classic Coke can, and said, <laughs> uh, Of course, Pepsi took credit for, for the whole thing. <laughs> they took credit for... for for forcing them their hand into trying to make this new Coke. And I mean, arguably, yeah. I, I'm sure they had a lot to do with it. Uh, 85, uh, RC was kind of still around, but almost out of the, the, the thing. Almost out of the way. Uh, but now Pepsi had its own struggles in 1992 when it introduced Crystal Pepsi. And it failed to impress my generation. And there is definitely a little bit of foul play in that. Do tell, my friend. It has a lot it has a lot to do with Coke. Okay. Coke. I forget what the actual drink was called. I don't think it was a Coke drink. But I believe do not quote me on this, because I have not touched up on this in weeks. Coke created almost like a subsidiary, a smaller company, to make a Crystal Pepsi equivalent. And they put money into this campaign for this crystal, this clear soda, just to make it purposely fail to take Crystal Pepsi off the market. Okay. I'm looking it up. Okay, because I don't remember exactly what it was called. I know Coke was behind it. It's Coca Cola Clear. Was it? Yeah. Okay. And there's still one place you can get it. Really? There's also one place you can get Zima that's still produced in Japan. Oh, well. So much for that. <clears throat> yeah. If you want one, you got to fly to Japan. I don't have that kind of money. So, um, uh, today the brand is diversified far beyond what Caleb Bradman, Bradman uh, could ever have envisioned. In addition to classic Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, they have Diet Pepsi, they have caffeine-free, they have some without corn syrup, they have cherry, they have vanilla, uh, tons of celebrity endorsements. They've branched out into sports drinks, Gatorade brand. I forgot Gatorade was owned by Pepsi. Aquafina bottled water, Amp energy drinks, and Starbucks coffee beverages. Starbucks coffee beverages? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, that's really the history of Pepsi. Um, there was a lot of shenanigans. Oh, yeah. To go over the history of one, you really kind of have to cover them all. Yeah. Well, like, or at least you have to cover Coke. We touched we touched some of Coke, uh, but we will be doing Coke. Yes, I we we could go ahead with the research I have now. I but I really want to make sure I get everything. Yes, because with this one, I, I I researched this today, and I completely forgot about the submarines. Yeah, I I I, I remember it as soon as you said. It, I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. And I'm sure there's other we're forgetting about. Because, like, when we were talking about Coke before, before the podcast started, I brought up Coke Black. I'd never heard of Coke Black. Coke Black was a failure. Even worse than New Coke, I think. I, it, it couldn't have been worse than New Coke, and I'm going to tell you why. It couldn't have been as, as widespread. New Coke, they changed, like, they geared the entire company that's, into New Coke. That's fair. That is a fair argument. Now... We'll definitely talk about this more when we get into Coke. And I think Coke has definitely diversified much more than Pepsi with their drinks because you've got what? You've got Coke, vanilla, diet, caffeine free. That looks disgusting. It was in 2006. 2006. 2008. See, that's something I want to make sure I get into. Yeah, because I'm sure there's a bunch of stuff that Coke will try to hide, especially like shady, the shadier stuff. In the early years, I'm sure there's some stuff that happened more recently that we probably won't be able to find. Well, there is a lot of conspiracy theories when it comes to Coke. 
Oh yeah, I I believe it. Uh, another podcast on the Deluxe Edition Network covered it, and and they they talked about some of the things with 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 Coca Cola, how they are still supposedly putting cocaine in their their uh, uh, recipe. I don't I don't know how you'd get away with that. Well, they explained it, and it makes sense because what they explained is very true. But this is going to have to wait for the Coca. So. Okay, I'll have to wait. So that's a teaser, my friends. A teaser. More conspiracies. Nothing. We we can't believe anything we see. It's all lies. It's all lies. Lies, I tell you. There's dark secrets behind the scenes. So, my brotherhood of beer is closed. I have my blueberry lemonade with Tito's. Um... But we took on the history of Pepsi Cola. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. But we took that on. Now you go take on the world. Our podcasts exist because of listeners like you. To find other great shows, head over to the Den Dot Show. Thanks for listening. Hold on, stop. Welcome back to the Shit Show 2.0. Okay, Boomer. Damn millennials. Wow. <laughs> Did not know that. Even flirters who who are obviously mentally ill. You want to be my wife? Oh, this is gonna go downhill real quick. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>